Well, hi everyone. How would you like to actually lend to the Lord, to God? And how would you like to be doing good in such a way that he takes it very, very personally, directly? We'll find out in this teaching today how that works. Uh, I've talked about this topic before, but this time I'm, I'm, I'm including a lot of pictures. I've adjusted it a bit so it makes uh, so it comes to life a lot more for all of you watching it. In Proverbs 19, verse 17, which we'll post these on the screen, of course. Proverbs 19, 17, he who has pity on the poor lends to the Lord, lends to Jehovah, and he will pay back what he's given. When you, when you have pity on the poor, God takes that like you're giving him a personal loan. I'm going to show you today just how much God notices you when you do something good or something bad to especially his people and especially to the poor of his people, the least of these, his brethren. Jesus takes it so personally, probably much more so and intimately and directly than we even begin to realize. Can you actually think of lots of times that you've helped the poor, the least of these, and lots of times that you have pitched in, especially those in the body of Christ and especially those who are in the super poor parts of the world, in Africa and Asia and other parts, they are so poor. And they may not be the same color of skin as we are. They may not speak English like we do. They may not be as educated as we are. They may not know their Bible as well. Or they might know their Bible a lot more than we do. But they're so poor. Proverbs 28, 27. Proverbs 28, 27. He who gives to the poor will not lack. But he who hides his eyes will have many curses. So we are to do good to all people, especially those of the body of Christ, the very body of Christ. I'm going to show you today the very deep meaning of a story you've probably heard and know well, but that Jesus uh, taught. But I want to make sure that we don't miss the central point of it. Be turning to Matthew 25, the end of it. Do you want to inherit the kingdom of God prepared for you since the foundation of the world? Well, let's go on and read this. I first gave this sermon, Matthew 25, starting in verse 31. I first gave this sermon back in 2009. I was told just before recording it, in my spirit, as I was praying about the sermon. No kidding. It was just as clear as a bell in my mind, the words that you missed the whole point. You missed the main point. Do it over. Don't, don't give that one. It was just that clear. And so I, it came to me as I started redoing it. And I shared that then. I'm going to share it even more so now with pictures and photographs. Uh, this is such a crucial lesson that we all learn and understand, and most important, apply. And I will bear my soul in parts of this as well. So many of you are going to be shocked and surprised at what Jesus is actually saying in this passage. Matthew 25, 31 to 46, When the Son of Man comes in his glory... <clears throat> and all the holy angels with him. Then he will sit on the throne of his glory. All the nations will be gathered before him. He will separate them from one another. As a shepherd divides his sheep from the goats, he'll put the sheep on his right hand and the goats on the left. Then the king will say to those on his right hand, Come, you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. I was hungry. You gave me some food. Verse 35. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you didn't let me keep feeling so lonely. You brought me in. You took me in. I was naked, and you clothed me. I didn't have clothes. I needed clothing, and you helped me out. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison. And you came to see me. Who did he say was hungry? Why? Why did he say this? Who did he say was thirsty? Who did he say was a stranger? Who did he say had no clothing? Who did he say was in jail, in prison? Who? And for whom were all these good deeds being done? He said, I was hungry. I was thirsty. I needed clothing. 
and you did something about it. You did something, he says, for me. The righteous had no idea what he was talking about, never recalled ever seeing Jesus in, in the flesh, as it were. And so then the righteous answered him in verse 37, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you thirsty and give you drink? When did we see you a stranger and take you in, naked and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? And the king will answer and say to them, Assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you did it to one of the least of these my brethren, my brothers, if you did it to one of the least of these my brothers, you did it to me, for me, to me. I want that to really sink in. There are different levels and kinds of hunger and thirst, of course. Don't limit this hunger to just being hungry for food, though that does seem to be the context, but there are hurting people out there hungry for acceptance. I've been there, hungry for a friendship. I've been there, needing a friend. When you know people who are sick or physically hurting, they need some attention. Be there for them. They need to see you and I care about them. Anyway, so they said, we have no idea what you're talking about, basically is what they're saying. Verse 41, then he will say to those on the left hand, the goats, depart from me, you cursed into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. I was hungry, you gave me nothing. You didn't give me any food, I was thirsty. You kept me being thirsty. You didn't give me a drink. I was a stranger. You did nothing about it. I was naked. And you said, so what? A lot of people are naked. You did not clothe me. I was sick and in prison. And you didn't bother even thinking about me, visiting me. And they will answer him and say, Lord, when did we see you hungry, thirsty, stranger, or naked, or sick, or in prison, and didn't serve you? Then he'll say to them, Assuredly, I say to you, as much as you didn't do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And those will go away. These will go away to everlasting punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. It's the everlasting punishment, okay, not punishing. God is not a terrorist who's going to terrorize us with torture forever and ever. That's a different topic. What's Yeshua? What's Jesus saying here? When my brethren, members of my body, he's saying, needed help, and you did not help them, it was like you weren't helping me. I saw you disregard their need. After all, many say they're just poor people. They're just Africans. And we hear all these reports about how they can scam us into sending money and never need it or to use it for other things. So no, I'm not going to waste my money over there. I don't know those people or just agents. They'll always need help anyway. Never ends. I've heard those comments. The second group, the goats, basically said, Lord, if we had realized it was you, if we had just realized it was you who was needing help, we surely would have helped you and clothed you. We never saw you, though. And therein was and is the problem. Do you see Jesus with believers all split up into all the various factions we now have and continuing to split off? Maybe we'll find many of us missing this vital point because Jesus had to explain it, but we don't see Jesus in the lives of other brethren in other countries and other groups, especially if they're not part of our group. The goats are people who didn't rec accept or recognize the body of Christ correctly. In other words, they don't recognize the family and brothers and sisters of Yeshua, Jesus, Jesus Christ, the church brethren, especially the least esteemed ones, the ones who aren't educated very well, the ones who have no money, the ones who, who just are backward. Okay? Uh, let me ask you this, including me. Would you, based on what you're doing now and have been doing in the last year, would you be considered, honest question I want you to think about, would you be considered a Matthew 25 sheep who helped the least of these, my brethren, or would you be considered a Matthew 25 goat who didn't do anything about anything? Which would you be? James 2, verses 14 to 17, 
James chapter 2, verses 14 to 17. What does it profit, my brethren, if someone says he has faith but doesn't do anything, he has no works? Can faith save him? If a brother or sister, for example, he says is naked and destitute of daily food, we have people I'm working with right now, a blind man in Africa, I just got an email from the other day, yesterday. He's blind and he's disabled. No way to get a job. They don't have social security over there the way we do here in Kenya. I'd really like to help him. Right now I'm on zero in funds because there's so many needs. But then I get his letter and I would like to help him. I, I, I had people vouch for him, who he was. Is he telling the truth? Is it a true story? Yes, it is. I do that for everyone I send money to. Most of the time I send the money to the pastors for them to spread out. But anyway, and then one of you says, depart in peace, be warmed and filled. Boy, I hope things go better for you. You'll be in my thoughts and prayers. Thank you for letting me know. But you don't give them the things which are needed for the body. So what? How does it profit them? Thus also faith by itself, if not accompanied by works, is dead. I'll keep you in my thoughts and prayers. I wonder if they even do that. But James says, no, if you have food and they need food, give them some food. Or if you have money and they have no money, so they can buy food or buy other things they need. But you only say, I'll be praying for you. I'll be thinking about you. And that's what probably most of us do. But what have, we, what have we really done if that's what we're doing? Yeshua, Jesus, is also making the point that there is a place in my body for even the lowest of the brothers and sisters. Even the poorest, even the farthest away, even the least educated. If they're a part of his body, he says they're a part of me, part of him. Don't dismiss them so easily. So who makes up the body of Christ? He says, you've done it unto me. 1 Corinthians 12, we'll put it up there right now, verses 12 to 14. You know, as in any body, you have one body. I have one body, but on this body, in this body, part of this body are many different parts. I've got fingers, fingernails. I've got arms. I've got hair. Oh, some left. I've got a forehead. I've got eyeballs. I've got a mouth. I've got ears. I've got a nose. I've got a chest and so on. Different parts making up one body, so is Christ, verse 12, 1 Corinthians 12, 12. Verse 13, for by one Spirit we were all immersed, baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and have been made to drink into one Spirit. For in fact the body is not just one part or member, but many. So you were immersed in one body, the body is Christ. Whose body is it? Ephesians uh, 5, 29 and to 30, No one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as the Lord does the church. And so we are members of his body, of his body. Okay? Or brethren from around the... Okay, when I just jumped, my eyes jumped. We're members of his body, of his flesh, and his bones. Colossians 1, 24, For the sake of his body, the church... So church members, the brethren, are what Jesus means by his body. And since Jesus is the Son of God, if we're a part of him, we are also, if we're part of his one body, we're also sons of God. Okay, that means we're children of God. When Father looks at you and me, he should be seeing Jesus Christ. So think of yourself as a body part, a body member of Jesus. You might be a finger or the skin on the back or a tongue or ears or something. In the body of Christ, he is the head of the body, Colossians 1.18 says. Colossians 1.18. We are other body parts. As I've just said, Paul goes on in chapter 12 to talk about the hand, can't say I don't need the foot, cause, or that I'm better than the foot, and the foot can't say it's better than some other part or, or worse than. We need every body part. We means anyone with God's spirit. The body is anyone with God's spirit. Romans 8.14 says, 
For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God. Romans 8, 14, everyone led by the Spirit of God does not say if you're part of this or that church of God or this fellowship or that assembly or some other name. It just simply says if you're led by God's Holy Spirit, if you have God's Holy Spirit, verse 9, Romans 8, 9, then we are sons of God. Someone who has the Holy Spirit is part of God's church and they could be well be among the least of these, my brethren. No matter what you think of that organization or that group or those kind of people, if they have God's Spirit, God right now is judging me and judging you. Are we providing food, clothing, shelter, companionship, and love to the least of these, his brethren? I grew up in an organization that for years thought they were the only true church of God. And any other believers out there were not part of that true church. They had to be part of our church or they weren't. I can't believe that anymore. And that one true church has since split up into many, many different organizations. Continues to split. So now what? So it's simply this. I don't care what your organization is. If I can have proof and evidence that you are being led by God's Spirit, then you are part of the body of Jesus Christ. And anything I do to you, good or bad, I'm actually doing to Jesus Christ. So let's jump back again. Matthew 25, verse 37. The righteous will say, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, thirsty and give you drink? When did we see you a stranger and take you in, naked and clothe you? Or when did we see you sick in prison come to you and he came? See, they, they were doing good deeds and not even thinking much about it. So they had no idea what he was talking about. And the king will say, well, when you did it to all these people that were members of my body, who are part, therefore, who are my brethren, my, my brothers and sisters, when you did it to the least, not the best, not the, not the pastors and the speakers and the good personality and the wealthy, to the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. And I think I've found some very good people who fall into the least. Not almost least, or lower down, least. So I want you to hear this carefully. Watch the pictures that we come to them eventually and study them, look at them. Jesus identifies intimately with his brothers and sisters. So whatever we're doing, since they're, since they're part of his body, he says, you can be praising me to my face all you want, but if you're kicking me in the shins by being unkind to my brethren, I won't like that. I won't like that. I'll be very upset with you. He talks about putting them in the lake of fire. Let that sink in. So would God, would Jesus Christ say you're a sheep or a goat? Are you one who's helping the least of these, my brethren, or not? So who is the least of these, my brethren, in practice? Let's go back to verse 40. The king will answer and say to them, I say, and as much as you did it to, to the least of my brethren, you did it to me. So who's the least of these, my brethren, in practice? Are you ready? The least of the brethren in the church of God, in the body of Christ, is Jesus Christ. That's going to shock you. Don't get me wrong. He's also the greatest under only God the Father, God Most High. He's also the King of Kings, Lord of Lords. He's the Rock of Ages, Rock of our salvation. He's the Lord of Lords. He's God with God. He is Savior. He's our Lord. He's our Master. And I'm His slave and servant. But He's the greatest. So understand what I'm saying. But because there are verses that say Christ is all in all, He's in the greatest all the way down to the least among His brethren. And the entire body he identifies as himself. This is my body. This is me. 
This is me, meaning the least brethren, the greatest brethren, the in-between brethren. This is me. And he's most concerned with the ones who really need help, badly need help. And there are many of us who can help. So he's the least of these because everyone who has God's spirit is in Christ and is Christ. I no longer live, Galatians 2.20, remember? The life I live, I live by faith in the Son of God who gave himself for me and loves me. Galatians 2.20, Colossians 3.3, 3, I, I use that a lot, Christ who is our life. So don't get me wrong, I get all that. But do you also get that he is also the least of these, our brethren? In your congregation, the hard of hearing old widow, who has no money, who needs help all the time, who's in pain, has no energy, has little money. Do you see her as, ah, she's just an old widow, or do you see her as, who? that's Jesus. The least of these, his brethren, that's Jesus. What can I do to help her? Can I go mow her lawn? Can I help her out? Can I offer to help lift heavy things or come over once in a while and see what she needs? You did it unto me. So herein is the problem. Your organization may not officially be teaching that they're the only true church of God. But in practice, many organizations really don't want you, and I've done it too. We really want to keep everybody under our fold if we can. We really don't like others in practice attending elsewhere, visiting elsewhere, learning from, teaching elsewhere. Better be careful. We go back to the definition. If someone has God's spirit, no matter what their church affiliation is, if God has given them his spirit, they are part of his church. Therefore, part of his body. You and I may be refusing to help Jesus because we don't recognize, like the goats, didn't recognize. When did we see you needing help? When did we see you hungry and naked and poor? We don't recognize the poor, illiterate, sometimes brethren who don't speak English well, who have no money for even just a bicycle or to buy a Bible. They really don't have money to buy their own Bible because it takes a whole week's income to do so because they earn so little. But we all have to realize if someone has God's spirit, he's part of the body of Christ and is Christ himself. So you and I can very easily be refusing to help Jesus himself. If you've repented and are in Christ, he is not ashamed of you either. So no, nobody in Kenya or Tanzania or Malawi or other places, he's not ashamed of them. Remember, he was a friend of sinners, tax collectors who cheated everybody. He ate with them. He healed them. He sat with them. They felt very comfortable around him, the most righteous being on earth. Hebrews 2, verses 11 to 13, makes it very clear he's not ashamed of you or me or them. He's not ashamed, okay? Or the poor, brown, white, black people anywhere in the world. Hebrews 2, 11 to 13, for both he who sanctifies, and that's God, and those who are being sanctified, and that's us, being made holy, are all of one, for which reason he's not ashamed to call them brethren. Jesus, Son of God, is not ashamed of me or you or the least brethren in Tanzania or in Cambodia or wherever they are. The Philippines, I will declare your name to my brethren. In the midst of the assembly, I sing praise to you. And again, I will put my trust in him. And here am I, the children whom God has given me. So look how easy... Uh, it is to not see Jesus. It's, it, it, you know, it's also part of our Passover that as we come to Passover, we take the Passover, we are to be esteeming 
other brethren as ourselves, greater than ourselves, better than ourselves. People like to call every time I'm recording, <laughs> I'll find out who it is. Anyway, but those who are being set apart for holy use uh, by God are considered the family, the brothers of God. Mark 3, verse 33 and 35, and Jesus was told, hey, your mom and your brothers and sisters are out here. What? Yes, he had brothers and sisters. Mary didn't remain a virgin. No, she did not. And here's one of the verses, Mark 3, 33, 35. But he, Jesus, answered them, saying, who's my mother and my brothers? And he looked around in a circle of those who sat about him, and he said, <clears throat> here are my mother and my brothers. Whoever does the will of God is my brother and my sister and my mother. Whoever does the will of God. And then, like I said, Philippians 2.3 says we are to esteem others, other brethren, better, more highly than we think about ourselves. And I've found brethren, sometimes even a pastor here, they're unwilling to do that, to admit that, to say that, because he felt that he really was, they really were not better than him. Didn't deserve to be in the same sentence together. I'm not kidding. He's not part of Light on the Rock. I'm not going to have people like that be part of the Light on, light on the Rock. So unchristlike. So what happened in Corinth? In 1 Corinthians 11, 22 to 32, 23 to 32, he talks about, and we're coming up to Passover as I record this in 2024, uh, how Jesus, um, the same night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, take, you know, we have this sheet of matzah or homemade unleavened bread, a whole piece. Don't be breaking it ahead of time. And then he broke it after he blessed he said, take and eat my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. So in the same manner, he took the cup after supper. This is the new covenant in my blood. I'm going to try to do a sermon, an updated sermon on what the, the emblems, just type in the word emblems, E-M-B-L-E-M-S, in the search bar. There's a whole sermon on what exactly deeply they each mean. More than just wine, more than just bread, and so on. And... As often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death. Therefore, whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup, verse 27, of the Lord in an unworthy manner, King James says unworthily, I think unworthy manner is my preference, uh, will be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. So let everyone examine himself. And so let him eat of the bread and drink the cup. You don't examine yourself and say, boy, I still fall so far short of Christ. So therefore, I'm not worthy to take, you, de you decide you're not worthy to take the Passover and you don't. That's not what it says. Examine yourself and then so let him eat the bread and so let him drink the cup. But that's not my point. Let's keep going. For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. Already read to you what the Lord's body was. In Colossians 1, I think it was 24, or Ephesians 5, or whatever, the verses I gave earlier, uh, the body of Christ is, is, um, is the church. So he's saying if you take it casually and in context, he was talking about how they were not being considerate of each other at the Passover service. And so he's saying you're being rude to other church members. And you're, therefore you're being rude to me. You're not discerning the Lord's body. The Lord's body is the brethren. For this reason, many are weak and sick among you. Many people are being healed. Many sleep, many die. For if we judge ourselves, we wouldn't be judged. Because of the way we're mistreating, disregarding, not esteeming highly fellow brothers and sisters around the world who have God's Spirit, who need you, who so badly need you and me. I took a long time redoing this sermon because I hate to beg. I grew up in the Philippines with my father, a missionary, and I often had to go beg for bread from the bakery. Can you hold us? Can you give us a credit line till my dad gets back? We were always so poor. I hate to beg. 
there are people who need you, badly need you. I need you to help me help, me help them. I really, truly do. Keep listening. Please keep listening. So one reason we're not getting healed, and some even die, even Isaiah 58 says this, is because the group, not necessarily the individuals who are sick, because the group is not discerning the Lord's body. They're not seeing Jesus and what they're doing. The NIV says, not recognizing the body of the Lord. The New Living Translation says, not honoring the body of the Lord in verse 30, no, verse 29, 1 Corinthians eleven twenty-nine. So, um, hang on just a minute. Yeah, 1 Corinthians eleven twenty-nine. So remember what Jesus said? By honoring brethren who so badly need help, who have no food, who have no drinking water, they have no tap. There's not a tap in their whole house. There's no flowing water. I'll show you pictures later how they get water. There's no shower. There's no flush toilet. None. There's no fridge. There's no stove. There's no microwave. There's no freezer. There's no car. There's no bicycle. Kid you not. The 1,500 or more people I'm working with right now, not a single one has a car. Only a handful, five, six maybe, have smartphones. Most of those are ones I bought. So we can communicate with them. The rest don't. You did it unto me. Again, if we knew Jesus himself needed help, I think we would help him. But he's saying, identify who I am. I'm in the least of these, my brethren. So they're incredibly poor people who have God's spirit, who are the body of Christ, who are not even being helped as much as we Westerners certainly could. And we've been uh, hurt and scammed and cheated in the past, maybe. And so you said, no more, never again. Uh, I know I have to. But I've made sure in the last couple of years that that won't happen, doesn't happen. I'm very severe on those who do cheat me or misuse money or anything like that. Like I explained to people, I can forgive you instantly, but regaining trust takes a long time. So for now, no, I'm not helping you anymore because you misused the $50 I sent or whatever it was. Um, <clears throat> so we're very, very careful now. and supremely careful receding and photographs and verifying with other people uh, seeing what the money was used for uh, anyway so do you want to hear God's blessing for having helped Jesus do you want to hear him say you're part of the sheep do you want him to say to you come you blessed of my father come inherit the kingdom prepared for you there's some people I'm working with who badly need clean drinking water, badly need latrines to go number one and two in. Even the latrine, some of them don't have latrines wherever they meet at church. They don't. I'll talk more about it in a minute. But to make it clear how this really worked out, you can look on the screen here in a minute, the Acts 9, or if you have your own Bible. To really make clear that God, Jesus, sees the brethren as himself. Now that I've said all that, I think this story about the calling of the Apostle Paul when he was called Saul. can't remember what Saul means now. But Paul means little. He was a very super zealous Pharisee. Hated Christians. Hated them. He was applauding, he was approving the stoning of Stephen. Happy to see it happen. He got real busy dragging men and women into jail and murdering some, he even says in a couple places. He murdered Christians, or made sure they were. Hated them. And then one day on the way to Damascus, Syria, to bring back more Christians from Damascus. Syria used to be a Christian country, as did Egypt at one time, as did much of Turkey at one time. 
All of these epistles of Paul, that was mostly to Turkey, Greece, Syria, and so on. Now understand the words spoken by the Son of God. Acts 9, verse 1 to 9, Then Saul, still breathing threats and murder, and murder, against the disciples of the Lord, against the body of Christ, if I can, went to the high priest, asked for letters from him to the synagogues of Damascus, so that if he found any who were of the way, the Christian way, whether men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. And he journeyed, and he came near Damascus. Suddenly a great light, a light shone around him from heaven. And he fell to the ground. He was knocked off his high horse. And he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Or maybe it was Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? And then the Lord said, I'm Jesus, whom you're persecuting. It's hard for you to kick against the goats. I've been trying to goad you to come to us, but you keep resisting that. The men and women you're beating, tying up, hurting, jailing, even killing, those people are me. Why are you persecuting me? You're doing that to me because that's a part of my body. They are me, and I'm in them, and they're in me. Why are you hurting me? And I find it impossible to think that Saul didn't know who Jesus was. As dominant as he was among the Pharisees, I'm sure he saw and heard Jesus. Now he saw his, heard his voice. Jesus? Is this bright light? You're kidding me. So he, trembling and astonished, verse 6, said, Lord, what do you want me to do? I hope that's your question right now as you're hearing the sermon. Lord, what do you want me to do? And then the Lord said to him, the master said, Arise, go into the city, and you'll be told what you have to do. The men journeyed with him, stood speechless. They heard the voice, but saw no, saw no one. Then Saul arose from the ground. He was blind. He couldn't see anybody. He was led by the hand and brought into Damascus. He was there three days and three nights fasting, basically. Couldn't eat or drink. Probably didn't even feel like eating or drinking. It's the same message as Matthew 25, when you've done it to the least of these, my brethren, or if you didn't do it to the least of these, my brethren, you did or didn't do it to me. He's saying the same thing to Saul to hear. Why are you persecuting me? Now, would you like to hear Jesus say, Come, you blessed of my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you? That's in, back in Matthew 25, 34 again. I was hungry, you did something. Who was hungry? I was hungry. I was hungry. Who was thirsty? Who was naked? Who was in prison? And how did you help him? by doing it to the least of these, my brethren. Are you brethren? Please, are you going to hear this? There are people who are in poverty beyond your wildest imagination, who have God's Holy Spirit, who love God's Word, can't get enough of it. And they eat once a day. All of them eat once a day because the $2 a day that they earn can only buy enough food for once a day if they're working. Some might go a day or two without food. Real people that we're working with, I need help so badly. I need help so badly helping these people. Some of them are meeting under trees or in the open air. I'll show you pictures in a minute. The sheep, the righteous, won't remember doing it to him. Then the Son of Man says, Yeah, you did it unto me. In Matthew 25, verses 37 to 40. Okay? So he sees himself as the least brethren, as well as he understands he's Lord of Lords and King of Kings, but he's so humble. Remember the verse I started with, when you lend to the, you know, if, you, if, you're, 
If you help the poor, it's like lending to God. At Light on the Rock, we have been introduced to some very zealous believers who want so badly to learn more of the truth and are responding. I almost left Kenya several times. A year ago, February 2023, I even prayed to God and I said, Father in heaven, I'm tired. I'm tired of helping Kenya. And I don't know if you need me there or want me there to continue there or not. You're going to have to give me a very, very clear indication that you want me to continue there. I had one church of 48 people that I was working with. I prayed that prayer within 24 hours, and to this day, I don't know how that happened, but several pastors got in touch with me by, they didn't know my prayer, by email, saying that they have a church of 100, a church of 60, a church of 30, a church of 200, whatever, different ones. And that they wanted me to teach them. Out of the blue, I had several emails. When I added up the congregations, it came to 500. That was February 2023. I'd started with 48. Now 500 wanted to identify with Light on the Rock. I still don't know why or how, because most of them, almost nobody has a laptop or internet connection or even a cell phone. But somehow they found us. And I heard about these 500. And so at the Feast of Tabernacles in 2023, by the end of it, we had about 600 people attending in three congregations, in three feast sites. 600, from 48 to 600. Now we're over 1,500, 1,600. I say 1,500. I think I'm going to call a little bit. Uh, some, some congregations or people, uh, if I'm... You know, I'm going to call a few, prune. And I think we're going to see a whole lot more. I understand that many from Malawi want to come. So they're so poor over there. I know poor. I was raised a child in a, as a child in the Philippines with my missionary father. We were considered wealthy in town because we had a decent house. But we had no car most of the time. Never had a telephone. Didn't know how to use the telephone. Had no running water, therefore no shower, no bath, no flush toilets. We didn't have a tap in the house. We had no screens on the windows. We had no fridge or stove or microwave. No, we didn't have anything like that. We had an ice box. We bought ice every other day or so and put it in an ice box. We did have a pump well, which most people didn't have out front. But we had no flush toilets. We had nothing like that. So I understand poor. I understand how poor my dad was with trying to do a, a, a Bible college and a senior home and an orphanage. So believe it or not, we were still a big step up from what I see among the Kenyan brethren I'm working with. Now please tell me all about the least of these, my brethren in Kenya and Tanzania. I'm going to tell you about them. Please hear me out. Please wait and watch and see the photos. In Kenya, they are baptized. They are Sabbath-keeping people. Many of them come from Sabbath-keeping congregations. Some don't. Some are ex-Baptist or Pentecostal, but now are keeping the Sabbath and the holy days. And uh, we're doing a lot of baptizing. I'll try to show pictures of baptisms going on. In brown water, we have to be careful the crocodiles aren't there. I'm not kidding. And I'm talking about people who love Jesus and Abba, our Father. Many, most of them don't own their own Bible. 1,600 as of today um, and uh, who, who are part of us. So I thought, okay, we'll go on a mission to provide at least one Bible per household. That's all I can afford. They're about 10 to $12 each, say $12 with a little case they come in. Um, it's not a lot of money, but that's a, that's a week's income for many of them. So they don't have it because that week's income has to go to food. Hand, hand, hand and mouth kind of thing, you know. You, you earn the money and you, you, uh, you buy the food and it's gone. Then you got to earn some more dollar or two. They're so poor. They need help so badly. The everyday member in Kenya and their family make our poor in America look rich. Our poor in America, even the very poor here in America, will all have a fridge. 
Only the rich in Kenya have a fridge. Even our poor in America have running water, uh, flush toilets, tap water, uh, stove, fridge. Not in Kenya. We might even have dishwashers for our poor. Not in Kenya. Our poor in America likely own at least one car, a bike. They probably have a smartphone, have a microwave. They wear decent clothing, even though they're poor. Not in Kenya. None of our brethren with light on the rock in Kenya, all 15, 1,600 of them, none of them own a bike, own a car that I could find, microwave, five or six have a smartphone. Um, I bought two or three of those. Most of the money I do send, I try to prioritize it for church use more than personal needs. But I'm aware of the verse about not forgetting the widow and the, and the orphan in their need. But I just don't have the money to start handing out to the brethren there who need it so badly. But I'm focusing on church needs. What do I mean by church needs? A place to meet, chairs to sit on, uh, maybe a smartphone for the pastor, especially the far-flung out, far-flung areas. Um, because right now I have four. That's it, four regular donors, and well, I might say five, who contribute everything from sixteen dollars a month to several hundreds a month, which allows me to take care of the people in Kenya to the extent I was. But now with sixteen hundred. I'm always, always out of money. And now we're registering the church and everything, Light on the Rock, and um, it costs money. You got to go to Nairobi, the capital, and spend time and money there. So income-wise, if these Kenyan Tanzanians, if they can find work, most earn a dollar and a half to two dollars a day. That's barely enough to buy something for the kids and wife to eat at home. The wife may be working also as a waitress, and she might earn maybe a buck a day as well. Almost all the brethren there eat one meal a day in the evening. Actually, I was told they all do just eat one meal a day. They don't have the money for any more than that. If they're a teacher, they might have lunch provided for them at school, but not for the kids. So no one I see over there is fat. Some few might earn three or four dollars a day and say twenty dollars a week. They might dress they might dress better, or they might be able to buy the uniforms and send their children to school. Those making one and two dollars a day may not be able to afford that. School is not free. And they have to buy uniforms if they go to school. They can't afford the uniforms. And yet if we don't help these kids go to school, we're going to perpetuate the poverty the illiteracy and the problems. We had a, an elder there buy half the uniform and then wanted me to pay the other half. In other words, the shorts and I pay the top or maybe it was the other way around. People don't have a dollar or two or three or five to extra. You know how over here, if you want certain food, you just buy it. If you want to try a new drink, you just buy it. If you see a shirt or dress you like, unless it's in a very expensive store, you just buy it. Or we have Goodwill stores here, and others that we can go and buy used clothing for just a few dollars. They don't have Goodwill stores over there that I'm aware of. It's not like that. And there's no extra money for anything anyway when all you make is a buck or two or three or four a day. And they're lucky to have a full meal a day. Lucky, blessed. Mark 9, 35 to 37. He sat down and called the... Um, said to them, if anyone desires to be first, he shall be servant of all. And he took a little child and said, set them in the midst of them. And he said, whoever gives one of these little children in my name, in my name, receives me. Here we go again. Even a child, you're receiving him. Can you hear Matthew 25 in that? I was hungry, you did it unto me. We had a man and his wife, a man, his name was Solomon, his wife's name was Sylvia. And they live in the Kihancha area. He lost his job. He was fired because he said he couldn't work on Saturday anymore. And because he was fired and jobs are so hard to come, come by, they went a while without buying food. 
His wife was seven or eight months pregnant. She hadn't eaten for a while, so the pastor let me know that. All I had to send available, I think, was $30. That's all I had myself. So I sent that. And that bought them some food for a while until we could send some more later. We have a blind man, like I said to you, who, who's blind and, and infirm, uh, disabled. He badly needs some help. I'm talking about spirit-filled, converted, strong brothers and sisters may be more zealous in the Word of God than many of you hearing this. Of the five, let's say five donors uh, who help every month, I don't know what I'd do without them. I don't take a single penny for my own use except one man has said, I want to send you, Philip, a little bit of money every month. It's not a whole lot, but it's certainly helped because I'm now retired and I don't have a pension. But anyway, so he sends a little bit, and I do spend that on ourselves. But other than that, any money's coming in, I don't take a single penny for our use. I don't pay the ministers there. I don't have it to pay them anything. And so what I do try to, to do is pay their travel expenses, reimburse them for that. Now, last night, one of the main pastors there, Francis, sent me an email that a thief had broken in and stolen all his clothes except a couple trousers, he said, and a couple shirts, everything else. But I'm at zero right now. I have nothing to send him. Waiting for some more money, hopefully, to come in. We use our own money. We're one of the donors ourselves, too, so we donate as well. Don't misunderstand me. But typically what a person does when they want to earn money is they go into town and stand in town and wait for somebody to holler for them to come over, someone who has a little more money, and come and watch my goats or weed my garden or paint my house or whatever it is. And then they give them a buck or a buck and a half or two at the end of the day. They may or may not hire them back the next day. So there's money. The money they make is just not enough Certainly not enough to pay also the electric bill and buy clothes and medical bills. Malaria is rampant. Malaria. I'll talk more about that in a minute. But with $10 a week, going all for food and whatever bills they have, and very, very tight, they can't buy clothing, they certainly had no money to even buy a Bible. So typically their leader, the pastor, had a Bible that he would read to them. So we're trying to provide that, especially you know, several, I'm using money from several for the Bibles, but one man in particular named Paul, he lies there with MS and he's completely paralyzed, neck down. He has a trait now, can't even speak much of the time. God bless him. He has bought so many Bibles with the money that he sends, and they sure love him for it. When we hand them a Bible, we don't just give them money for it. We give them the actual literal Bible. It's not unusual when they are given their Bible. We give them the opportunity to tell us what size print font they want. We give them the opportunity to say what language they want, what translation they want. And one man said, wow, he says, finally, I can hold in my own hands a real Bible, God's word in my own language as he held it close to his breast. Praise God, he said. Hallelujah. Paul likes being a part of that. I do. I, it, if you'd like to be part of that, we are having all these people come in. They need Bibles. Please, we need Bibles to hand out to them. Transport for church services. Some of them just can't afford the bus fare. We have to sometimes send money to a family or so to help them get to church services. Nobody I know of over there owns a car or even a bike. Most of our American brethren own two cars, maybe three, if they have children and teens. Nobody I know in Light on the Rock has a motorbike. I did buy one for a pastor some time ago, but he's not with us right now. But um, nobody even owns a bicycle. At least that's what I've been checking. 
urgently, urgently, we need people to get mosquito nets. So we're buying mosquito nets. 80% of the people who die of malaria in Kenya are under the age of five. They haven't built up their immunities and everything, and they die. Uh, our, the same guy who was, had his house broken into, his uh, brother, his younger brother's little boy, four-year-old boy, got malaria, and by the end of the second day, was dead. They didn't have money to send him to the hospital or to get shots or be treated or be examined or be given medicine. All I know is little four-year-old is dead. Made me cry. Because we, we lost our little boy. As far as I'm concerned. That four-year-old over there is my little boy, too. Because we're all part of the same family. They can't afford mosquito nets. We're trying to get some. We're trying to find government programs that might even help get a mosquito net or two in some homes. We have another woman who lost her two sons in malaria. And then a couple of weeks after the second one died, she got a stroke, probably from all the stress. Now she's largely disabled with no sons around. And so when a deacon there I love very much, when he told me that his new six-month-old baby had malaria, and we prayed for her, but I also did say, go take her to the hospital. It says the, 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 the well people don't need a physician, but the sick do. Jesus said. So remember that. So I said, take her to the hospital. Get her on the medicine she needs to be on, the right medicines. Couldn't stand to see her die. And then right after that, her brother, a three-and-a-half-year-old, Prince Wisdom is his name. He got malaria. He still has a cough, but we're able to treat him. But then that uses up all the money they have, so I had to send, then send more money to pay for food. Malaria. If the government would go all out and attack malaria, they should be able to beat it. Now, when you need water, you just go to a tap. You probably have five or six or seven taps around the house, not counting the outside faucets. You just turn on a tap. Out comes water. No such thing among the brethren that I'm working with. So for the Feast of Tabernacles, we bought big water tanks on the church buildings where they meet in. Otherwise, it has to be bucket after bucket after bucket of brown water from dams or streams have to be boiled, still be brown, I imagine. Look at the photo that I think we're showing you now, I hope so, of a boy trying to fill a container of water, scoop by scoop. Hope, it, hope a crocodile doesn't grab him. And there should be a second picture of a bunch of them carrying buckets of water. That's the typical church member we have. There's no such thing as flush toilets, showers, and taps. Can you help us help them, please? Please, can you? Will Jesus say you were a goat or a sheep? It's up to you. For church services, some of them are meeting under a tree. We sent one of our pastors and his wife to an outlying church area one time. He may or may not have known, but there was no latrine for that church building. There was a church building. Here, we'll try to show you the building. Uh, we bought them the, uh, the roofing because all they'd had before that was just a bunch of branches as part of their ceiling over them. So we brought them a proper ceiling and roof and bought them windows and doors. I don't know how thankful they are. They should be. <laughs> but anyway, uh, when our pastor went there, his wife had to go to the bathroom. It had been raining, so she had to go out in the wet bushes to do her number two because they don't have a latrine and I don't have the money. I didn't have the money to buy them a latrine or make them one, to pay for the wood, the cement, and all that that would be needed. Are you understanding what I'm saying? 
Their latrines are basically just a hole in the ground, cement over the top, with a hole about that big, maybe a couple holes. No seat to sit on because they can't afford the seat, and I can't afford it either. I'd love to buy them the plastic seats that they can sit on. So the women and, have to, and the men have to squat over that hole and not miss. Squatting down. Even at the Feast of Tabernacles, that's the way it is. These are the people God has given me to work with. The least of these, my brethren, you tell me you know anybody in America who has it that bad off. What do we do for the feast? And by the way, I want to tell you again, we do get receipts, we do get confirmation of what's happening, I do get photographs that the latrine got built and all of that. And if I get any indication that I'm being scammed, I don't work with that person. They, they're, they're out. Now let me talk about the Feast of Tabernacles. When we go to the Feast of Tabernacles, we're talking about which, which one we get to choose to go to. We fly there, we drive there in a nice car, and we get a nice hotel or motel for our family, or our husband and wife, or the family, and it has nice restaurants. And we meet in a nice meeting place. And we keep the family together. Not in Kenya. I was shocked. No, there's no money to even get there to the feast. We have to help them get there. There's no money for a motel. There are lots of motels. But who has money to pay for a motel per family? So they don't. So what we do is we buy a bunch of these, literally hundreds of mats now. They lay those down on the floor, sometimes the same room that they meet in. Men in one room, women in another, or, or a couple, couple rooms each. They have to separate husband and wife to keep all the men together, the boys, and the women and the girls in a different place. There's no showers, there's no bathtubs, there's no... So they try to keep clean other ways. They can't afford restaurants. There are lots of restaurants, but they can't afford it. So we buy all the food and we have them bring as much as they can. We cook the food, we serve it to them. At least one a day during the feast, sometimes more. We, do, we did provide the latrines and a water tank for the, for the feast sites. After services, what are they gonna do? They talk Bible. Fellowship. Romans thirteen, Romans twi twice, Romans twelve verse five, Romans twelve verse five says, "So we, being many, are one body in Christ. You and I, and Americans and Canadians and Europeans who have more money, we who are many are one body in Christ, in Christ, His body." members of one another. We must not be like the goats who said, when did we see you needing help? I'm telling you when, the, when you're seeing Jesus needing help. I'm telling you. The day, within a day of me praying, if you don't need me or want me to continue in Kenya, I'm pulling the plug, February 2023, that very 24-hour period, 500 people indirectly contacted me. 600 showed up at the feast. Now we're over 1,600 and growing. Will you be a goat or a sheep? It's up to you. Don't risk it being you. 1 John 3, 16 to 19. 1 John 3, 16 to 19. By this we know love because he laid down his life for us if I'm coming a little too strong for you, I apologize. I need help so badly, helping God's children. And we're just growing like gangbusters. He's blessing the work we're doing faster than I can keep up with it. I need help. They need help. I need help helping them. 
Do you know what it's like to hear that someone has malaria? Four years old. And you don't have any cash on hand to send them, but you try anyway. You send them a few bucks to go check with the doctor. That happens over and over. First John 3, 16 to 19. By this we know love because we, he laid down his life for us. We also ought to lay down our lives. I'm not asking you to die for these people. I'm asking you to help. We ought also to lay down our lives for the brethren. But whoever has this world's good and sees his brother in need and shuts up his heart from him. Verse 17, don't let that be you. Shuts up his heart from him. How does the love of God abide in him? We have food in our pantry. We have lots of food in the fridge. We have lots of food in the freezer. It's not enough for us to just say, I'll keep you in my thoughts and prayers. Be warm, be filled. It's got to be better than that. Verse 18, my little children, let's not just love in word and deed or tongue, but in deed and truth. So we do verify who's using the, the funds. I've said that already. I'm also insisting that the groups do everything they can to try to come up with any money they can as a group to provide for some of the things they're asking me to help them with, whether it's a smartphone for the pastor so he can communicate with us, whether it's a build, to build a latrine. I said, okay, you come up with a third of the cost for the latrine. They give me what it will cost, and I say, okay, you come up with a third of that. And when you do, I'll see if I can do the other two-thirds or whether it's a new building because they're meeting out in the open. Let's show some here, out in the open, out in the dirt, under a tree. We have several, three or four congregations right now who are not meeting in a building. We have one congregation in Mbani that are meeting in a building that's dangerous to meet in. We have to build a new building. That one's ready to collapse, so I'm told. I don't have the money to do it. We've got to do it. So I asked them to try to generate some group money. So they try growing maize, what they call corn, and then selling it later on. But then they got to buy the, they don't own any land, so they have to rent the land. Then they have to buy the seed corn. Then they have to buy fertilizer and tools to do all this. They don't have money for that. So then I have to provide that. Then maybe next time it goes a little more smoothly. So when we're growing this fast, help is needed for mosquito nets, bus fare, food, emergencies, helping pastors visit outlying areas. That's another church need. Photocopies. That's another church need. We're, we're doing a lot of the sermons and, and blogs, uh, meet and do season, being translated for free into Swahili. I say for free. These guys take a lot of time doing it. I like to pay them for that if I could, but we certainly help them buy reams of paper. We buy the photocopiers. That's part of the church needs. So we can photocopy hundreds of these sheets of paper to hand out so people understand in Swahili. Many of them don't understand English very well. We really need some help, <laughs> even if it's just a small amount every month. If a lot of you respond, even with a small amount, 20 bucks or 30 bucks, if there are a lot of people doing that, that would help so much. I have somebody who just sends $16 a month. Somebody sends me $35 a month. It doesn't do a lot. But when you combine them together, it starts to add up. And I really, really appreciate those who are helping. You've done it unto Jesus Christ. Realize you're doing it for him directly. So... As you do it to them, you're doing it to him. Proverbs 19, 17, He who has pity on the poor lends to Jehovah, and he will pay back what he's given. Reminder, when we don't do anything to help, when we can, we fall into those who are on the left, the goats of Matthew 25. Don't let that be you. 
Sure, sometimes we just don't feel like helping somebody. We're not overflowing with cash. None of us are, unless we're super rich. By Kenyan standards, all of us in America are super rich. Or maybe you say they might have done stupid things and we feel they deserve what's coming to them, so we don't help. Or maybe we have heard that they aren't always honest with the money, so we don't help. Well, I'm the one making sure. And we try to give them an actual item, like a Bible, if, as much as possible, or, or, or a photocopy, or whatever it is, whatever is needed. But I feel so guilty because so many need help with food. So you might hear the needs of the brethren in Kenya and just ignore it. Uh, they should be able to do more themselves, you might say, so we do nothing. Or we think everyone's food, everything is so much cheaper over there, so we do nothing. Smartphones cost the same over there as here. Food is not as cheap as you might think it is. So we do nothing. Actually, many, many things over there cost the same as here, or sometimes even more. So which are you, a sheep or a goat? Philippians 2, verse 3 and 4, Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit. In lowliness of mind, esteem others better than yourself. Let each one look out, not only for his own interests, but the interest of others. These Kenyans are people of the church. When Jesus walked the earth, he fed the multitudes who were hungry, thousands of them, the 5,000, the 3,000, the 4,000. Because it says he had compassion upon them. They weren't in the church, so to speak. He fed them anyway. He healed them anyway. So I hope you're going to be giving this very careful thought. Very careful thought. If you wish to have a great way to help the least of these, my brethren, that Christ says, Go to our homepage, lightontherock.org. Right at the very top, you'll see the, the, the list of words up there. One, one will say donate. Just click on that. Or you can scroll down a tiny bit. You'll see a great big button that says donate. And you can donate either by, I believe, by PayPal or by a credit card. It's quite easy. So thank you. Thank you so much. And if you can do it every month, something every month, I think in the kingdom, Jesus Christ will be able to tell you names of people you kept alive. I mean, Protoss little girl, six months, and his little boy, three and a half years. If we hadn't given him the money to go get the medicines they needed and see a doctor, those two little children would most likely be dead right now. They used up all the money they had. So I had to buy food. Oh, I was telling you about Solomon and his wife who was pregnant. And he had lost his job with the Sabbath, you know, not working on the Sabbath. And so we sent the money for her to have some food. Well, she finally had a, her baby. But even here, the placenta uh, was in front of the baby instead of, the, instead of afterwards. And there were complications. And again, we had to help her in the, with hospital bills. Um, her mother said if it weren't for light on the rock, Sylvia would be dead. And so when they got in touch with me, it was very urgent. They couldn't afford the hospital. They couldn't afford anything. But God will tell you these are names of people, numbers of people who were able to go to school because of you, were able to get uniforms and get an education. These are people's names who are alive because of you. You did it to me, the least of these, my brethren. You can also send a check made out to Light on the Rock to my home address, which I'll put in the notes. I'll put it on screen right now, in fact. Or we'll just put it in the notes. Caring and loving people. Let me wrap up with a couple... Oh little more than a couple scriptures, but I, I don't want to go too much longer. But Ezekiel 16, um, verse 48 and 49, 
God lists the sins of Sodom. He doesn't here even list the thing they're most known for. But in 49, look, this was the iniquity of your sister, Sodom. She and her daughter had pride. Boy, isn't that something? Gay pride and all that? Had pride. We have pride months and all that now. Fullness of food. Abundance of idleness. Neither did she strengthen the hand of the poor and needy. So one of the things God hated most about Sodom was they didn't help the poor and needy. Isaiah 58, I'll just put this up there, or you can look it up in your notes. In verse 7, this is about fasting and all that, but in verse 7, is it not to share your bread with the hungry and to bring to your house the poor when you see the naked to make sure you cover him and not hide yourself from the, your own flesh? And he says after verse 7, if you do that, verse 8, then your, the light shall break forth like morning and your healing shall spring forth speedily. We're not seeing enough healings. Is it because we are letting these least of these, my brethren, who make a buck or two a day, not receive the help they really need? I don't mean trying to feed them all. I mean put systems and places and things in place that we can help them. And they certainly are learning a lot. They love Light on the Rock. And they love what they're learning. And they love the help we're giving them. I need your help to help them. Hebrews 6.10 God is not unjust to forget your work and labor of love, which you've shown, shown towards his name, in that you ministered to the saints and do minister. So here again, Hebrews 6.10, 610, the, the love and the labor of love you've shown him, his name. How? In that you ministered to the saints. You served them and do serve, do minister. Praise God. I know some of you will respond. I sure hope so. I'd like you all to be sheep. Regular monthly donations or whatever you can. I'm not asking for Light on the Rock to become your target of all your tithes and payments. We're just asking for some help, please. Tithes where you want to. We need some help. So praise God. I know some of you will respond. And in doing so, you will be serving Jesus. You'll be blessed by God. You'll be serving the Messiah, the Son of God himself. Hallelujah. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we come to you and we just love you and adore you and we just ask in Yeshua, Jesus' mighty name that, yeah, we can do a lot more to help the least of these, my brethren. We can show a lot more love to you, Jesus, to you, your body. There's so many in East Africa, so many even in Asia. I know others who are working with people in Asia, in the Philippines, Cambodia, and Pakistan, and we in the West, whom you blessed with money, compared to what they have and don't have, put it in our hearts, please, to send regular help. Continue to send these people to Light on the Rock, Father. We will take care of them. With your help. Through these sheep. In Jesus' name. And I pray you will bless them those who are helping, let them know that you know that you know what they're doing. Watch over our people in Kenya. Father, there's, malaria is such a terrible plague over there. Can I ask something, almost sounds strange, but I'm going to ask you to command the malaria mosquitoes never to bite your people over there anymore. We ask that in Jesus' name. I believe that. I believe you can do that. Nothing is impossible for you. There's so much malaria going on. We pray for healing. We pray for your gifts of your spirit. We pray for understanding. We pray for more people to have their minds open. And we pray for ways to help them and ways to help you, dear Jesus. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs> Visit the Light on the Rock website 
where you can view additional videos, over 600 sermons and blogs as a scriptural study reference for those who desire to have a closer relationship with God the Father and His Son Jesus Christ and learn more about His incredible plan for all mankind. We are not a church, but a nonprofit organization providing in-depth biblical studies free for all who would like to visit our site. The Light on the Rock Foundation also supports an orphanage in Kenya, providing financial resources to support their living costs and education. We never ask for money. However, any donations are greatly appreciated and will be used to support the Kenyan Orphanage and our site. Thank you for visiting, and if you find the site beneficial to you and your family, please share with others.